Hi, everyone, and welcome to Where Are We Now? This is Theater Alberta's brand new podcast, highlighting our community, our events, and the initiatives here that make Alberta great. We are joined today by myself, your host, Andres Moreno, pronouns they, them, and by Bradley King and Heidi Johnson uh, on behalf of our French theater. Hi, pals. Hello. Hello. How's it going today? Um, it's a it's a drizzly Sunday morning, <laughs> Monday morning. It's a drizzly Monday morning here in Edmondson. Um, I love drizzly Monday mornings. I love drizzly mornings. I don't know how you feel about them, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping to do some more uh, painting out on my deck, but now that it's raining, I can't. So, oh no, too bad. Uh, <laughs> I get to bake bread instead. <laughs> oh, so tough. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. It is definitely a drizzly morning that feels like a Sunday, even though it's definitely a Monday. But here we are. Thank you for joining me here today, pals, to talk a little bit more about Fringe. Uh, I'm very excited about this episode. I'm excited to hear about your perspectives and your experiences working for Fringe in the last couple of years. I'm wondering if, uh, Bradley, you want to start off by just kind of anybody who might not know about Fringe. Do you want to give us a little introduction to what Fringe is? I know it's been around for 43 years now. Okay, so imagine this. The year is 1982. Um, the city gives this dude, Brian Paisley, some money to start a festival. Um, so back then, we were not called Fringe Theater. We were called Chinook Theater. And the city was like, hey, there's this cool thing that's been happening in Edinburgh called a Fringe Festival. Do you think you can do that here? And so Brian took the money. And with Chinook Theater, they made the first ever Edmonton Fringe. At that time, it wasn't actually called a festival. Um, I love the poster from that year because it was a Fringe Theater event. We weren't even considered a festival yet, but that's how we kind of got our roots. And then since 1982, the festival has just grown and grown and grown and grown and become this wonderful, massive event that supports so many artists and volunteers and other stakeholders every year. Um, so that's kind of like the light history. If you want to get into a deep history, you have to be like, what is a fringe festival? Well, in Edinburgh in the 40s, and I'm not going to go down that route. <laughs> um, there's a little fun story there. But yeah, so we've been around for 43 years now. This will be our 43rd festival in 2024. And we're here. It's been around for 43 years. How long have you been around? Oh, gosh. Uh, I was born in 19... 19- I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> how long have I been around? Yeah. Uh, I So I'm um, not a newcomer to Edmondson, but I wasn't born here. So I moved here back in 2013, and I attended my first Fringe Festival. Honestly, I don't think it was until 2016 or 17 when I had started staying here during the summers, and I could actually go enjoy it. Um, and my first Fringe show ever was called Scum, a Feminist Manifesto. And... I fell in love with the show. It was so good, so fun. And I was like, what is this Fringe Festival? What are these things? Who are these artists? What are these shows? And then I loved it so much. And in 2018, a, a job opportunity came up and I was like, I love theater. Let's 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 apply for that. And I, I got it. So I've been with Fringe Theater since 2018. I was their systems analyst for about five-ish years. And then recently I have switched over to be their director of engagement and technology. So I'm running on six years. Yeah. Heidi's been here longer than me, I think, though. Yeah. I was going to ask, Heidi, how long have you been around? So, like, <clears throat> honestly, not much longer. Um you know, I'm not that much older than Bradley. <laughs> uh, yeah. I also didn't grow up in Edmonton, but I did grow up in Camrose, which is, uh, you know, an hour away to the southeast. Um, and we would come up in the summers and go to Fringe sometimes. Specifically, my, like, first memory of Fringe is coming up for a few days with my dad, just the two of us. And we stayed at the Varscona Hotel on White Ave. And it was just this like perfect little mini vacation of staying at the hotel and going to fringe shows and, and eating, you know, street food. Um, and my memory of that is even more like about the hotel than actually fringe because I was so excited that they had robes. Uh, oh it was my first time staying at like a fancy hotel that had robes. Uh, so I always really associate that with my first memory of the fringe, which is great. But I got more involved myself in first in 2015. Um, I was taking a summer off of not working and just volunteering at all the different festivals. It was really great. So I was able to really get involved that year um, and volunteer in the beer tent. So I'm, I'm a volunteer since 2015 technically, but then I moved to Calgary for a little while um, and came back to Edmonton in 2019 and volunteered in the beer tents again 
in the meantime, I did volunteer briefly at the Calgary Fringe, which was really fun. It's such a smaller little fringe and you just get really into the weeds right away. Um, and that's something about me is I definitely get into the weeds on things right away. So within just a couple of years of volunteering for the Edmonton Fringe, I was asked to be a team lead for our beer tents. And so I've been a team lead with the beer tents since 2019. Um, so that's essentially a role where you're still a volunteer, but you're helping coordinate the other volunteers within that team. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that since 2019. And and I've also been a host volunteer for a few of those years as well, where we have artists come and stay with us in our home during the Fringe Festival as well. That's awesome. Are you still volunteering with like all of the other festivals as well? Or, or do you kind of like pick and choose and then make sure Fringe is one of them? Yeah, definitely less so. Um, now that I am working full time, it's it's harder to do all of the festivals in the summer. Mm. I volunteer through the year. I'm on the Edmonton Food Council. So that's another kind of more full time volunteering that I do. Um, but otherwise, might do like a little bit here and there. But the Fringe is my main volunteering gig. I take the entire festival off of work. It's my favorite vacation that I do every year. You know, staycations are a thing, but it feels even more than that because I'm very rarely even in my home during that time and just really fully commit to being part of the festival in those 10 days. That's wonderful. So let me ask you both this kind of question, this follow-up, um, with how long you've been involved in the festival and like, you know, through employee or not employed, like what keeps you coming back to the festival? Okay. I, do you mind if I go first on this one, Heidi? Yeah, go for it. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, why do I keep coming back? Well, yes, I'm employed, but uh, <laughs> no. the real reason is I truly love the community that Fringe creates. Whether you're at the festival, you're going to a show, you're in the beer gardens, there are always people to talk to who are always so excited about all the things that are happening. And we get to really like enjoy that community and build it. I've made so many friends over the years through like artists and volunteers and other people who have worked with us that I just don't really see elsewhere. Not that other festivals aren't doing it, but I I deeply love this like beautiful community we've created and the community like in Old Strathcona that it creates as well. Everyone knows who we are. We all know everyone else. I walk down the street and I see people I know through the fringe and I'm like, oh yeah, like I feel like I belong here and it feels so good. So that's probably my biggest draw. Um, and there's also all the side draws. I love the art. I love watching independent theater. I love hanging out with my friends on a Saturday night, having a beer on a patio. Like I love doing all those little things and our festival facilitates all of that so it's a mix of things community the activity itself love it all yeah <laughs> on the note of walking down the street i was walking down the street the other day and bradley walked by me and didn't see me <laughs> <laughs> where were you i told you about i told you about this when we were at the <laughs> barbecue <laughs> Yeah, you did. That was my bad. I'm sorry. He was very into his conversation. And to be fair, I also didn't see him until we were like a meter apart. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> but that's so true, though, that you do. Edmonton is, you know, I know this is such a cliche of many places, but, you know, like a, a really big small town, right? Where, and I find the fringe in particular really encompasses that feeling of, yeah, you're just constantly running into people, you know, like Bradley said. I think it's really cool that it is both that for Edmonton, but then also for all these artists that come from other places as well, that they have that community that kind of just travels between all these different fringes, which is really fun to be part of. Obviously, community is a big part of it. To Bradley's point, I'll try to touch on some other points. One of them that I think is is funny for me in particular is I very much like to do things that are within like a 15 minute walking radius of where I live. <laughs> and so who knows if I didn't live close to the fringe, if I would be as involved as I am. Um, but I am quite permanently located nearby, which really helps. I really like being able to just walk over, ride my bike over um, and, and be involved that way. I also think that you know, it, it's a festival where you can get involved in a lot of different ways, which is really nice. And so I'm someone who really likes to like deeply involve myself in something. And there was room for me to do that at the fringe and, and feel very useful and like my skills are valued. Um, right. So able to bring some of my skills from my regular life into the fringe and, and really contribute in that way. But it's also really great for folks that just want to like do their four shifts uh, and and be there and be involved in that way. And so I think that's not the case for everything, uh, for every kind of festival. And so that's definitely something that keeps me coming back is just that really feeling involved and, and valued and like our 
inputs are really taken into account. I think the Fringe Festival has done a lot of really great work, even just in the last, I'd say, like five years on improving the volunteer experience. I think it's a really profound professional organization and how it treats its volunteers. It's a really smooth, like from application to volunteering flow. They've put a lot of effort into that in the last few years. Um, I think there's, you know, a lot of great festivals out there, a lot of great places that people can volunteer. And so it was really smart of the Fringe to put a lot of uh, resources into that volunteer experience. I find coming out of COVID and other people that I've talked to, there's definitely less of an appetite just in general for for volunteering and, and being involved that I've heard from people. And so I think that was really smart on the Fringe to, to really put that time and effort into their volunteers, mm. um, which is definitely something that keeps me coming back. That's lovely. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Not only does Fringe feel like a like a, a state of mind, for lack of a better word, you know, like it's like you're fringing, but also there's the physical grounds in the, it feels like the heart of Old Strathcona that really create kind of this, this hub where anybody can come and be a part of and be in a safe space and an open space and a welcoming space. Like, yeah, that's my favorite thing about fringe. Now, do either of you have any like favorite stories or something that sticks out from your years of working fringe? Like I remember one year I did a, a show with a puppet and just walking the grounds with that puppet was insane. The amount of people who just wanted to come say hi. So yeah, do you have anything that you've got like in the back of your pocket? I have some pictures of you walking around with that puppet. Uh <laughs> ordering like a drink at the at the beer tent <laughs> from my partner who was uh one of the beer tent volunteers at the time and, and just him like awkwardly interacting with you and your puppet which is really fun and talk about the small world right oh my god that's amazing <laughs> i can i'll try and find him and send you some um I, I like a story that i was thinking about when you know in prepping for this that i feel like kind of flows into what we were just talking about is the fact that it isn't just like quote unquote theater people. I think that the fringe attracts, which is really great. Specifically with that, I think when I was a new team lead, I was uh, at like a a team lead event, whether it was a meeting, I, I can't quite remember. Um, where, you know, people were, were talking and our volunteer fringe staff at the time. So the person who was um, responsible for, was actually paid to corral all the volunteers together. He had a, a background in engineering, had studied engineering. And someone I was sitting with was like, wow, isn't that great that, you know, this guy with an engineering background is wanting to be involved in the fringe. He's he's the only engineer I know who's involved in theater. And I was like, I think you'd be surprised. I studied engineering as well. And so did my partner. And so did all these like, and then I think a few other people at the table rose their hand of like, yeah, yeah, no, I've been involved. Like, you know, I have a more technical background or this sort of thing as well. Um, so I don't know. I, that's a story that really sticks out to me that as you know, like our kind of preconceived notions of the people that might be involved in fringe aren't necessarily always correct. And I think like yeah. Edmonton of all cities, really anyone, like everyone embraces fringe. I think you'd be surprised going around asking people at fringe what they do as like a Joe job, quote unquote, the answers you would get. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's something special about like Edmonton in particular with that. It's something I've been thinking about recently with our art scene of that it, you know, is a city where the cost of living is still relatively low compared to some other cities, but it's still a city, right? And so it has this like beautiful mix of you can actually be an artist and live here where I think like a lot of places that isn't the case anymore. So it, it, I think that really contributes to our art scene in the city. A hundred percent. Yeah. Heidi, I'm so glad you brought up the, the like background thing. Like I came into this with a degree in physics. I did a 180 on my career path and went into the arts and it's such such a diverse range of people who go fringing. I think it's so funny. A lot of people will assume, oh, it's just theater lovers. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like everyone comes here. And the best part is when they get here for the first time and they see what it's like, they love it and they keep coming back. Like I've never met someone who just came to the festival one time and then was like, oh, that's it. No, no, no. They <laughs> they always come back. I think I've got a lot of really favorite stories over the year, but I think one's more on a personal note. I remember... When I started working here and started doing Fringe, my parents were just like, because they don't live in Edmonton either. They were just like, what is our son doing? What is this theater that he's working for? What is what is a Fringe? And then I finally convinced my mom to come in 2021. No, 2022. It was 2022 when I convinced her to come. I was like, hey, I've got a day off during the festival. I'm going to take you to a show. We're going to bring my aunt along. And just watching her 
like see her first fringe show and have that first experience and finally click like oh I get it. This is great. And I'm like, yes, yes, it is. Like that was such a such an important moment for me. And now she comes every year. She comes every year for the festival. She comes and sees a show with me. Uh, and it's one of those like connections I got to build, even though it's it's my own mom. But um, I really do value like what the fringe can do because of that. And I thought that was just like a beautiful experience. And then there's also other ones like the nerdy side of me is I read every survey that people submit to us, every single entry, and just some of the the kindest words people say about us in even in these surveys these are anonymous surveys and they're just like we love the fringe i saw this show i love this artist i had such a great time here you need to keep doing what you're doing and you know once your 600 survey results in you get a little tired but even then those little ones just keep lifting me up every year so i have like so many quotes in my back pocket from those surveys so that's like my nerdy one is just survey results which is what everyone wants to hear about i'm sure <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like my nerdy one is uh, maybe not nerdy as much, but like I efficiency is like my thing. And I really like I'm like intrigued by lines and like how we get through cues and things like this. And uh, when I wasn't a team lead yet, but just volunteering in the beer tents, I always wanted to be on cash because just like my favorite thing was we'd get this big long line of people wanting to buy beers. We had a ticket system at that time where they had to first buy a ticket and then they could go get their beer. And I was like, I want to sell the tickets. And just that feeling of like having this huge line on a Saturday night and being able to like take over from the previous person and and just like sell a ton of tickets and get through it. Just like super satisfying. I think, you know, you can find (laughs) those moments. (laughs) Totally. And let me yeah. tell you, I think the nerdy answers are probably perfect for us. <laughs> let me talk to you about statistics. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, I feel like I'm, Bradley like, collects all this information. I'm like, tell me more about the sales when <laughs> I'm like, bugging him to send me all the numbers. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, the information that you, Bradley, have on the whole festival, just from the statistics you gather, I'm like, that must be so intriguing to like put together and see how it changes too. Oh, it is some of the coolest stuff. We're in this really interesting position as like a festival and as an arts organization that, you know, Edmonton has so many independent theaters, like so many independent theaters, and they're quite a bit in terms of size, like smaller, just in your productions. So we get all this really cool data um, that I do always want to use a little bit more where I can see how shows, like which shows do well. I can see which artists do really well. Um, I can see how patrons love to buy. Fun fact, Edmonton is so last minute. And by that, I mean 30-ish percent of tickets are bought the same day of a performance. Hmm. The same day. Like people are just like, yep, I'll go to that one today. Um, Which I love. It's a double-edged sword because it's a bit stressful at the box office, but it is something that is very unique to Edmonton, how last minute we are. So that's always a fun number to crunch. Yeah, lots of lots of cool little weird facts like that. I'm guilty of that. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, I am too. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm the number there. Yeah. But I also think that speaks also to, I mean, yeah, we're last minute city, but I think with Fringe specifically, I think people show up and they look at what's happening and they just decide to jump in. And I think that Fringe has garnered this kind of like side of the audience where it allows us to be a bit more risky, I guess, for lack of a better word. There's two types of fringers. There's the people that get their program the day it's first available and they go through and read every show and they tag the ones they want to see and they put their schedule together and they program it all in. And then there's the people that show up last minute and buy a ticket. <laughs> there's nothing in between. <laughs> yeah. I I try to be the in-betweener and I'm like, I'll plan, but then it never works. And I'm, I become a last minute fringer every time. I do love it because this time of year, as Heidi mentioned, I have friends posting their schedules on their Instagram stories with their spreadsheets. And I'm like, oh my goodness, y'all are planning and I love this. Um, I am, will not be able to achieve that. Maybe one day. I like to. It's like it's like the morning person debate. You know, it's like oh, I want to be a morning person. I want to be a fringe planner. I do. <laughs> I. Me too. This year, I, I'm going to try. But have I tried other years? Absolutely. Um, but I, I feel I feel good about this year. Have I changed anything? No. But I feel good about it. <laughs> 
feeling. Also, you two are working the festival, so it's not like you have a ton of free time around the festival to plan, right? No, but the the flip side is you'll you'll catch me at a lot of late night shows because of that. Because I'll mm. often work during the day, and then you will catch me at midnight performances a lot, like 10 p.m., 11 p.m. That, those are the ones I usually go to. I, I always love the midnight ones too because there's a different energy when a show is starting like at midnight. And I don't know, they're great. I love them. I remember I had one to perform and I was like, this is going to be the worst. And it was the one that sold the best. And it was like the best audience. I feel like at midnight, if you're going to be at theater, you're welcome to like whatever is going to be thrown at you. Yeah. Yeah, it is a cool thing about like the fringe type shows. I think just independent theater in general, right, is that it, it is a little bit more yeah like you don't really know what you're gonna get but i think fringe audiences are really open to that which i i I enjoy a lot um you can go to like a fringe type show at a different time and and it can be really great but there's something about doing it during fringe in particular where the audiences just have like a certain expectation of what they're gonna see and i I really i like being part of a fringe audience in particular yeah it's a very cool audience to sit in i think we've all been to shows at like the Jube, for example, like a Broadway across Canada show or a Citadel show in an A house, something like that. And no shade on the audiences. They're great, too. But like a fringe audience, there's this kind of energy where they're like ready for something maybe a bit weird, maybe super emotional. And they really like I'm not a fan of audience participation shows, but fringe audiences, they know what they're looking for. They'll, they'll be there. And they love it. They love to be a part of the shows like yeah. <laughs> no one else. <laughs> So Heidi, question for you. So did you did you originally choose to work in the beer tent? And if so, like what excites you about working in the beer tent specifically as part of the festival? Yeah, totally. I alluded to this a little bit, but my day job is not in service or retail or anything like that. And I actually, I don't think I've ever done a, a retail job or a service job, which um, I, is like, I know quite interesting. My like summer job when I was younger was working in like on a farm, like on a market garden. So (laughs) growing vegetables. So I've had my grunt work time, but just not in like in a bar or that kind of thing. And I think at the time I was like, I had just finished my engineering degree when I I first volunteered. I was like, I want to do the exact opposite of that. Right. I want to just be like, do something where I'm, it's very straightforward. You know, it's transaction, you're dealing with people. Um, it, it felt like something that would be quite, uh, engaging, I think is the reason I I chose that one for sure. And I I always really enjoyed like the busier shifts, right? You can definitely have sometimes volunteering in the beer tents on a rainy day in the middle of a Wednesday where there's not a lot of people there. And those definitely weren't my favorite, but you still get a lot of chances to talk to people, which is really nice to other volunteers. But yeah, I wanted that experience of like having like more of a, a service type role. And and we have some people that volunteer in the beer tents, you know, that, that is their bread and butter that they do all the time and they're amazing. But also a lot of people like me where that's not really what they do on a day-to-day basis. And it's kind of like a nice uh, step away from your norm, right? Yeah, to be able to provide that service in that way and that you might not normally in a day-to-day basis that's so cool so do you find that you get the same people volunteering year after year and you kind of make that little community of like oh how's your year been and you kind of get that catch up (laughs) absolutely yeah we we've just started doing our uh beer tent specific orientations and actually all the team specific orientations in the last week and we had one earlier this week where i think we had like, like almost there was a lot of people attending this one and we said, like, you know, who here is a, a first time volunteer? Uh, and like three people raised their hands. Right. And like the other 40 had all volunteered before. Um, I, I don't know, Bradley, if you have any statistics on like different teams returning volunteers versus new volunteers. But I think Beer Tents in particular has a lot of returning volunteers. And we've actually had quite a few in the last couple of years. that would be like, I didn't sign up in time. And these returning volunteers didn't even make it on uh, into the festival, which is always too bad. But. Yeah, yeah, lots of returning, lots of, yeah, like, how was your summer? And sometimes you have these people that are, like, really great friends, but the only time you see them is during the festival, which is fun. <laughs> yeah, I I don't, I do have the stats on that. I don't have them in front of me, but, um, like, Fringe has a really high volunteer retention rate, which is the stat that measures, like, how many people return each year. Um, and I think Heidi spoke to it so well. It's like, there's this, like, you see people over and over again. They come to volunteer. There's that community they they've built um 
And it's truly a delight. And I think what's really special about the Beer Tents team is it's one of those really like patron facing teams where you get to talk to nearly everyone who comes to the festival. Most people will stop at a beer tent at some point. And so you get all of those lovely interactions. Those are some of my favorite moments is like the one on one with the patron or the artist and talking to them and saying hi. And then even the slow times. Yeah, like the Wednesday, the rainy afternoon on the Wednesday, you still have your other volunteers with you who you get to hang out with, too. So there's some perks still. Hmm. Uh, speaking of, actually, that was a great segue. <laughs> uh, Bradley, For since we've been talking about the loveliness that it is volunteering for Fringe, do you want to talk a little bit about like how someone would sign up? Uh, what does that look like? And kind of like just give us a little bit of rundown of volunteering at the Fringe? Totally. Okay. So how would someone sign up? Generally, you apply online. Uh, applications open up usually in the spring. Um. You can apply online, but also if that is not your vibe, you got to do it in person, come say hi to us. We'll help you out. We can make that work too. Once you've applied, and usually you apply for a team, but a lot of folks, they don't know what team they want to be on yet. So they apply what's called a general application. And we work with them to help them find a team that they might be interested in or suits their skills best or something that they're, they really want to try. Then once you've been accepted as a volunteer, there's a few other steps over the months. Um, you might have to do a criminal record check, for example. You might have to sign a waiver here and there. It depends on the team you're on. But eventually, you're like accepted. You're on a team. So you've done your application. You've been approved. Great. You're volunteering with Fringe. Once that happens, you'll start hearing communications from your team leader. So that's like Heidi, for example. Those are our wonderful volunteers who also organize other volunteers and manage their teams and train them and whatnot. In June, July, you'll start hearing from us more and more. And July is when what's called team-specific training starts. So that's when you actually get to come to the Arts Barns. You get to meet other volunteers on your team. So you get to meet your team leaders, and you actually get to do some training with them. There's also some other training. Like, we do a lot of online orientation with folks. So they get to take... They get to take a volunteer orientation that is on our platform called Fringe Learn. But with that, they also get access to some other cool courses. Like we have a course on consent, two courses on consent, actually. And this year we launched a an anti-racism 101 course, which is really cool. And then another one on gender and identity. I'll talk more about benefits later, I'm sure. But they get to do some sweet courses. Once you've done your orientation, you now just kind of like wait until closer to the festival and then you actually start volunteering. So you come to your shifts, you check in what's called our volunteer headquarters where you have some other volunteers who get to greet you, sign you in um, and then send you on your way. And then you go and maybe volunteer at the box office or your front of house or your beer tents volunteer or you're doing kids fringe. There are 15 volunteer teams. There are so many volunteers going around. So that's kind of like the steps to become a volunteer. Apply, get accepted do some orientation and then enjoy the festival. And do you know about how many volunteers are, are a part of the festival every year? Yeah, it depends on the year. So this year, I think we're hovering around 900 and some. Um, in some years, it's been as high as 1,200, depending on the needs for the year. And each year, those needs change. As our festival grows and evolves, our volunteer needs do as well. Like this year, we had a big increase in the front of house team, for example, because we were scanning tickets at more venues. And so they had to fill in like a bunch more. Whereas other teams, like I think Heidi can speak to this a bit, Beer Tents is a bit more stable because we only have so many places to serve drinks from. Uh, so yeah, this year around 900, but it has gone up and down depending on the year. Yeah, that's a that's a huge number. Um, now, I, I know we've talked about the beer tents. We've talked about a little bit about Kids Fringe, but there's a lot of different kind of factors to it, right? Like, for example, like the community care team and, and you mentioned Fringe Lerm as well. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering how you say this, but Pehonan? Oh, Pehonan. Hey, Honan. Um, yeah. And so I'm just wondering if you want to talk a little bit about kind of these, for anybody who might not necessarily know that Fringe is more than just come see a show, drink a beer. Like what else is going on in the festival? What else can people take in? Oh, there's so much happening. So like we start with the artistic stuff, the indoor and outdoor shows. A lot of people talk about the theater, but there's a ton of fringers who never go see an indoor show. They're a really cool audience. Um, we mentioned earlier, you can go drink a beer, you can hang out. With that, you can also see outdoor performers all over the place. We constantly have outdoor performers and buskers. So you'll be walking around site and you might see someone like juggling a uh, bowling pins on fire. And then you'll walk a bit further and hear two euphonium players like playing a jam. I love those. Those folks are some of my faves, actually. <laughs> um, so you have your buskers and outdoor performers. You have Kids Fringe, which is one of Canada's largest children's theaters festivals, which is a really cool. It's all free. It's great for families if you have like kiddos 12 and under. Um, 
that's on the north side of our festival site over in Light Horse Park. So they have a ton of kid friendly programming and activities. You can go do crafts. You can go do like this kind of adventure forest activity they've got this year. You can watch shows that they actually program. They'll bring performers in who are specifically there to entertain kids. So Kids Fringe is super fun if you're a kiddo. Beyond that, we have our music series. So that kind of goes in tandem with the beer tents, which is really neat. So we have this big stage out in um, ATB Park or McIntyre Park, as it's formerly known, that you can go watch some really rad musicians perform a few times a week. So that one's really cool. There is our Pehonan, which is like this indigenous led program that has art and practice. And it is a a part of it's a a TP we construct on site. Um, So you can go there. And honestly, hang out and take in some indigenous art and other activities that we program over at that space. We have the community care team. So that's a volunteer uh, program and uh, initiative we have where we acknowledge we're an inner city festival and we take up a lot of space. And with that, we do often displace a lot of folks. So we are always trying to, you know, like they're fringers too. They're our community too. And we always want to make sure that even with how we build up this festival and how big it becomes that we're always accommodating folks as best as we can and taking care of our community around us. And that's what the community care team does. So they come and they address like vulnerable folks. We have food, we've got snacks, we'll provide water, we can provide some care to them too. So that's what that community care team does. It's a really cool program. You'll see them out on site. I believe they're wearing purple shirts. So if you see the purple shirts, that's our community care team and they do a lot of great work. Um, oh my gosh, other things. We have our community patio, which is super fun. If you want like a chiller place, just like hang out and talk. Um, it's a bit quieter. You can go to the community patio that's just outside our lobby here. I like having my lunches there. It's really nice. Mm. Um, there is the artisan and food vendors. If you want to like see some craft goods or eat some mini donuts. I eat a lot of cone. Spaghetti in a cone. That's a. They're coming back this year. Uh, they sell arancini balls, which are some of my favorites. There's just... <laughs> There is so much. Uh, it's a it's a big <laughs> event. Um, and that's just what we do here on our site, too. If you head over to Lassite, they have this really cool music series they do every year as well, which is highlighting local and francophone musicians. Um, other, like, if you're around the neighborhood itself, like, all the businesses are doing stuff for Fringe, too. The restaurants are packed. They're always a good time. Our pals over at the Next Act are super busy <laughs> for 11 <laughs> days straight. Um I don't know if I'm missing anything. I'm sure I am. There's just so much to do here. Uh, I think it's, it was cool to touch on like the little additional nodes that pop up, right? Like over at yeah. La Cité with the the bring your own venue because there's both the fringe sponsored venues. I'd say, right? What do we call them? Uh, lottery the venues. Bring-around. Yeah, lottery yeah. venues that mm-hmm. uh, people get us uh, artists get assigned to, but then. The, the bring your own venues are are just huge, right? And and I think of over the years, yeah, created these these new little mini fringe grounds in other places around the community, which I think I really enjoy. And I think that really speaks to the necessity of fringe. The fact that like it did start a bit more like in close in, in Old Strathcona, and it's as, as, every year it feels like, especially post pandemic too, feels like every year is starting to kind of like grow a little bit more and there's like oh you can now go to this part or like you can try this area and and it's not just all central so it's kind of really starting to become a city festival like a city-wide festival we make a little joke during our festival that we create a small city uh (laughs) because all of these venues and stuff they pop up and they get so busy and i think andreas what's really cool is that you mentioned is like there's these like little mini festivals all over the place what's great about the fringe is that all of these independent theaters this is kind of a time for them to shine and get like a lot of attention to their theater so for example like Varscona theater across the street often integrates a bit of their season into the fringe festival um over at lassite a lot of people like lassite has theater all year round um but sometimes fringe is like the one opportunity that people actually go there and discover it for the first time i think rapid fire theater is another good example over at the rapid fire exchange um they have this really cool graph that's like their attendance over the year. And it's like, they'll do like, oh, a festival. And then like another festival. And then the fringe, it goes like off the chart uh, and then comes back down. And because people are coming to them to see them for the first time and then they see it, they're like, oh, I can actually see this theater the rest of the year too. They do so much more stuff. So that's one of the really cool things about fringe is it highlights all of these artists and these theaters and gives them an opportunity to be like, hey, you like this? Come check us out the other 11 months of the year too. We've got so much going on. Hmm. That's such a great point too. Yeah, you're right. I think I think you're right. A lot of people 
Fringe is their first kind of step into realizing that we have such a vibrant and beautiful theater community here um, with so many uh, indie theaters. Um, can you talk a little bit, you mentioned it, but like the uh, perks of volunteering. If you volunteer, what are the perks like? Oh gosh, um, so many cool perks. Heidi is a recipient of many. Uh, that's a That was a bad joke, sorry. Um, okay, so, <laughs> you're a volunteer. What do you get for volunteering? Tons of stuff, actually. Yeah, I mean, so, I can... Yeah, do you want to like talk about the, it a little bit? I'll, I'll see see how many I can get, and then you you tell me which ones I'm missing. Because for, for our it. volunteers, things I can think of, I mean, you get a sweet T-shirt, uh, which is great, and um, a pin if you volunteer five shifts, uh, which mm-hmm. are very coveted, those pins. For every shift that you volunteer, you can get a ticket to go see a show or enter it into we have like a kind of little prize lottery. You can use it for that if you're like, actually, I already have my tickets that I need. Um, We do some cool volunteer events. So there's a pancake breakfast on the first Sunday of the Fringe uh, for volunteers. We also do a late night karaoke one night, which is a relatively new event, but is like a huge hit. And I'm already really excited about that. Um, Kate, no, that's what I, I, I can't remember. What are the other ones? Am I missing okay, any? Okay, first off, thank you for the shout out. I'm the host of Late Night Karaoke. Uh, it's the <laughs> coolest volunteer event of the year. I am very so biased when saying that. It is so much fun. Um, yeah, Heidi got most of them. So you also get like a festival guide. Uh, yes. You get this cool ID badge, which is like, it is your ID badge, but it's also a fun memento. Like people collect those, which is really fun. You get access to some volunteer social events outside of the festival. So when you volunteer with us, we do a few other like, because we want our volunteers to get to know each other. We want to build that community. So we'll do some other events before festival as well that every volunteer is invited to attend. There are things like screenings, dinners, socials, activities like that. So that's really fun. Um, during the festival, you get a dollar off your drinks at the beer tent if you're volunteering with us. Uh, as You can't drink on shift, but you can enjoy <laughs> one afterwards. <laughs> um, good caveat. You, good caveat. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Please don't drink on shift. Um, you get the show experience and all that stuff too. You get meals if you're volunteering. We serve you some food. Uh, our volunteer kitchen is very tasty, very good. Every day you have a shift, you can come get a meal. You can, oh, I'm missing one at the top of my head. Oh, and then we have like, I mentioned the courses earlier. That's kind of this cool benefit too. It's like you get some learning that's totally included with your volunteering. It's all very value-based, like consent and anti-racism and gender and identity. So if you're looking to learn some like cool new value-based skills, we're the place to be. Um, I think I got every one. Um, ETS has a cool partnership where if you volunteer with a friend, you get free transit to and from site, which is really nice. And then some businesses and stuff and our vendors will do like special deals for volunteers too. So you show your badge and you might get like 10% off somewhere or you might get like, you know, it's usually a percent off or something like that. So those are some perks as well. I like that you're like, I think I got them all. That was, that was tons. <laughs> that was way more than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's great. We that's love beautiful. Our volunteers very much. And mm-hmm. then also the you know fulfillment of feeling like you've contributed to your community, which is you know the number one. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much, pals. I, I I'm gonna ask us one more question, but this has been such a beautiful conversation. First of all, so thank you for anyone who might never have been to Fringe or is maybe scared to check it out. You know, maybe they they have no one to go with or, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, they're a little bit not ready to jump in. What would you say to them? What would you uh, say to entice them to check it out and and come check out this year's? I have a story that I was just that, that note of like going to Fringe by yourself uh, reminded me of it. I think this was in 2019. Um, someone that I <laughs> follow on formerly Twitter, now X, Uh, as a big fan of the French and posted like, Hey, if you're, you know, uh, I bought this, like whatever pass to French to see a bunch of shows. I'm going to be seeing a bunch. If you want to come join, like hit me up. And I was like, okay. Like we had a mutual friend, someone I know, but didn't know each other very well. And I messaged them being like, Hey, like, let's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a team lead. I'm going to be seeing a bunch of shows. Uh, and we went to the the opening ceremonies together and then saw a bunch of shows together. And they're now like one of my best friends. Um, and so, you know, be vulnerable, put yourself out there, meet up with someone from the internet that you barely know, and they might become your best friend. That's, that's my tip. That's great. <laughs> um, I love that story. Uh, on, on a flip side, I once went on a date to a friend show. Uh, and that's where I'm going to end that story. <laughs> um, no, it's a risky move. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of people go and uh, take your first date to a friend show, which happens a lot, actually. Um, yeah, I think my advice to folks is take that risk. Like the ticket prices are super affordable. So uh, if you you're probably going to like the show, I can I honestly can say that you're probably going to enjoy it. And if you don't, you probably will still see another one. The whole fringe experience is one of those things where once you try it once, it's very like, yeah, once you once you've tried fringing, I can guarantee you're really going to enjoy it and want to do it again. If you're nervous to go alone, there are tons of groups you can go with. I think one of my favorites is there's like a meetup group, like a meetup.com group of Edmonton theater lovers. So they are always going to shows year round, mind you, but then they make plans for the Fringe Festival as well. They're a great group to go meet up with because they just love seeing theater. And especially if you don't know anyone, you're going to meet a lot of people who have a common interest already. And then I think like Heidi said, like take a chance and go with someone that you may not know very well. Um, it's a great way to build those connections and talk about it afterwards. And who knows, maybe you'll make a best friend. You might maybe. make a best friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I also, I also, there's a low part. There's a, there, there's low key part of me that really enjoys when you go see a show and it might not be like your cup of tea, but you still walk away with a great story, you know? You still walk away with like a great story to be able to share. Uh, and yeah, I love it. Um, thank you both so, so, so much for being here. Uh, this has been wonderful. I'm so excited for this year's Fringe. Uh, I think it's going to be great. Oh my gosh. Okay, this year's Fringe. It's Fringe 43. We have over 200 shows. I think we're at 216 right now. It's over 1,600 gosh. performances. Um I am so excited for a bunch of the shows, y'all. I, I said I don't plan my fringe, but I, I know what shows I do want to see, which is great. It's going to be good. I'm very excited for everyone to come share the fringe this year. Yeah. And Festival Guides are out now, hey? Yeah, they're on sale. I was looking yeah. through my guide right before this. I was like, oh, I need to start planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Grab yourself oh. a Festival Guide. Tickets go on sale probably after, probably before this podcast comes out. So um, grab some tickets. Well, thank you, pals, again, so, so much for being here. I look forward to seeing both of you at the Fringe Grounds this year, saying hi and meeting in person. Um, and, and yeah, I'm really excited for the festival this year. So wishing you all the luck. And uh, thank you again for agreeing to be part of this podcast and talk a little bit about your experiences. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. We'll see you in the beer tents. We'll see you in the beer tents. <laughs> Bye. The Alberta's Where We Now podcast is produced with the operating support we receive from Alberta Foundation for the Arts, the Edmonton Arts Council, and Calgary Arts Development. We're grateful for their support. The Alberta is proud to work in and serve members across Alberta in Treaty 6, 7, and 8 territories, as well as Treaty 4 and 10, and all regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta. 